We got to stay sharp. We got to stay strong. We've got to be spiritually exercising. We've got to be ready to take the new country. When the Lord finally says, this is it, go. Sometimes when we give up too soon, we rob the next generation of what is rightfully theirs. So don't give up. Don't give up. That was just a snippet of all that we have in store for you on the family service today. Thank you so much for joining me. And on behalf of our worship team that will be here in just a few moments, my name is Kwame Rubadiri. I'll be the moderator for our service today. We have a wonderful special guest who will be ministering to us very, very shortly. But I'd like to welcome you to partake and participate in our worship experience with our CBS worship team in a few moments. Don't forget our hashtag today, which is hashtag God has promised. Over to you, worship team. Big up my coffee. Hey.
Thank you so much for staying with us, and I know you're in for a wonderful treat on the CBS Family Service today. Uh, we have a special guest, a special treat, who will be ministering to us. Many of you know her, and many of you have heard her minister and speak before, but she's here with her husband. About three years ago, uh, Dr. and Reverend Lynn Coles uh, left us and went all the way to Eastern Europe, to a country called Slovakia. And Slovakia is, uh, it, it, it neighbors Ukraine, I think it does. Yep. And, and Ukraine on the east, uh, Poland, Czech Republic in the north, yes. Austria on the west, and Hungary on the, the south. south. Wonderful. Yeah. So we'll, we'll, we'll show you a map so that you have a good idea where that is. But Paul and Lynn, it's wonderful to have you back with us oh, here in you. Kenya. This is home and has it been is. home for a long, long time. Tell us about life in Slovakia. Oh my, well, it, it is so different <laughs> than life we, we enjoyed here in Kenya. Yes. And uh, Slovakia was, was a communist country. That's right. And a lot of the communist mindset is still there. Uh -huh. This people, generally speaking, are, are suspicious, mm. they're secretive, mm. and not, not friendly like people mm. in Kenya in are. Kenya. Uh. And uh, so there was a lot of adjustments we had to make no to life in Slovakia. No doubt. And you went to uh, help with the Bible college. Uh, we did. And uh, yeah. our, our bishop at the time, Bishop Emeritus, uh, Dr. Ginde, sent you off uh, as, as part, yeah. part of the Sitam family yeah. to go and work yeah. with the college. Tell us a bit about that work and the ministry. So we, we work with the Apostolic Church. Yes. The Apostolic Church is the Pentecostal church in Slovakia. Ah. We have 42 churches. Yes. So it's a small denomination. Mm. And their Bible college is Gateway College. College. We went there at their invitation to begin a leadership program, yes. which we did. I direct, I teach in it. Amen. And then they made me president <laughs> of the college. So, <laughs> Congratulations. Yeah, I'm the president of, of Gateway College oh, in, in, Slovakia. in Slovakia. We went for two years. Yes. We will be staying five. Wow. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. It's, when it's all over, you'll have been there for it at least five years. It takes time to yeah. take new yes. territories. Yeah, <laughs> indeed it does. And, and, and you've had to, you haven't had to necessarily learn the language, but you work with a translator, I think. We do, uh -huh. yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's been difficult that way. But we left in 220. Yes. And remember our, our, our motto, our theme in 220 in Seatown was, yes. give me this mountain. mountain. Amen. Well, God not only gave us a, a mountain, mm. he gave us a country full of mountains. Wow. About 80% of Slovakia is mountainous. Incredible. And we've learned that when God gives you a mountain, it's not always necessarily an easy mountain. That's right. You know, it's a hard place for the gospel. Mm. In fact, missiologists tell us that about 1.7% of the population of the country wow. would be considered born again. Only so it's, it's mm. hard work, mm. but it is really, it's worthwhile work. It, Slovakia has significance Amen. in the kingdom of God. Amen. And the team we work with are working hard yes. to make the church really welcoming Praise God. and very friendly. Mm. And you can just tell when you walk into our Amen. churches, Amen. people are smiling, people are serving you. Amen. It's, it's really making yeah. a difference. Amen. It is. Yeah, Amen. Yeah. No, I, I would encourage those who would like to hear a bit more about the church and, and mm -hmm. maybe see some pictures to check out the link for Seaton Parklands. Yeah. Uh, because when you came back, you came back to your home church and shared yeah, a bit we of did. the yeah. story yeah. there as well. Yeah. Yeah. Now, it, it's a difficult area to work in and, and there are challenges and so forth. Uh, this is the year that we're talking about taking a new territory <laughs> and you've actually been doing this for a little over two years now. How, how can Seaton pray for you? And what are the areas that uh, you'd like us to sort of focus on yeah. as we remember you? Well, we're looking for breakthroughs. Mm -hmm. You know, we mentioned we yeah. got 42 churches. A lot yes. of our churches are under 100. There's, it's, growth is difficult. Mm -hmm. it, it seems so hard to get a church over 100 people wow. in it. Mm -hmm. And we really need breakthrough. Praise and God. we need a team of people who have just have this vision to, to see the church grow Amen. and grow and grow. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. So, and, and I think for us, uh, continued health. Yes. And um, also just that we would be continually baptized with love yeah. for the people. Wonderful. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. that's what you need, Praise right? Um, and we, we try not to compare Kenya and here <laughs> and there. Um, but, and, and we don't actually do that very often because mm. it, it doesn't help. Yes. Yes. But we need a baptism of joy and yeah. love oh, and, and energy, amen. energy to do what we do. Amen. Because we also work in Hungary and Budapest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I'm involved with their small groups. I preach at, in wonderful, the churches. Wonderful. And mm. 
So just energy. Praise God. Because we're not getting younger, we're getting... (laughs) I hear you, I hear you. We're in the same boat. Yeah. (laughs) But you are going to bring us a wonderful word. Uh, The title of your message is Refocus Mm -hmm. on the Promises of God. Mm. Um, Do you want to give us a a small snippet before Paul and I leave the stage and allow you to (laughs) minister? Well, you know, often our our focus narrows when stuff happens, and we'll talk about that. And I want to talk about how do you get your bigger picture back and put God in the picture. picture. Wonderful. And then determine what your identity is. We're looking yeah. forward. Yeah. Thank you so much. Reverend Lynn is our preacher for the day. And I'd like to invite you to uh, join us. And then when <coughs> this is all said and done, please share the link with your friends and anyone else who you know will be blessed by this message. Refocus on the promises of God. Yeah. Reverend Lynn. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Well, it's an absolute joy and delight to be here and such a privilege. And I I just never take it for granted when an opportunity comes, and especially to speak at home and to see so many wonderful people again. It's been amazing. And what I was just saying to Reverend Kwame there was this whole thing about how stuff happens where our focus narrows. And one one of the times our focus narrows is when a gun gets put in our face. Now, I don't know how many of you have had that happen, but police tell us and law enforcement officers that when that happens, the person who's got that gun barrel in their face, they cannot even describe the person holding the gun. They cannot describe the circumstances anymore. They are immediately focused on the gun barrel alone. And their bodies go into one of four responses. They either want to flee, they want to fight, they get paralyzed, or they start begging for things. And what happens is toxic chemicals are just released into their system, and they are stuck for hours and hours. And if they're not careful, if they don't deal with what has happened, they can get stuck there and paralyzed. I call it spiritual paralysis uh, for for ages, ages. And perhaps you haven't had a near-death experience But you've had someone say no. You've had someone in an argument just just deny you what you're asking. You've had somebody ignore your plans. You've had someone who got credit for your idea. You've got someone who threatened you or someone you hold dear, and you didn't get that promotion. Your dreams have been crushed. Maybe you lost someone very, very dear to you, and we've all had someone break their promises to us and or delay keeping their promises indefinitely. And these are gun barrels. All of a sudden, our, our focus narrows. All we see is the no, the threat, the broken, the delayed promise. And our bodies react. Our emotions kick in before we can process things cognitively and we lose focus on the big picture. And we forget where God is. And have you been there lately? I have. I think Slovakia was a bit of a gun barrel at first. Just we were there. We moved during COVID, and then to get to know a new get to know a new culture, it was it was tough. Some of the loneliest years of my life, some of the most difficult educational experiences. But we are supposed to be there, and so we opened up our focus, and we have allowed God to just help us see where He is and have a love for these people. And I want us to look right now at how to acknowledge the reality of what's happening to us, but not make it our identity, to ground ourselves by remembering the last thing God said and find out his opinion on our situation and then refocus on his promises for the future so that we can see the big picture again. And in this process, we need healthy self-awareness. We need healthy God-awareness. We need to remember, rehearse, and reclaim his promises and act on them. And there are many stories in scripture we could go to. And I want to go to four very quickly. And I want to show you what not to do when you lose focus. And then three, where you need to follow what they're doing in order to regain focus. So the first one is a very familiar one. It's Mark 4, 35 to 41. It's the storm, the storm on the sea, the one where Jesus is asleep in the stern. Uh, So let me read it to you. It says that on that day when evening came, he said to them, 
let us go over to the other side. Remember that, let us go over to the other side. Where was Jesus going? To the other side. Where were the disciples going if they kept their focus on him? To the other side. So leaving the crowd, they took him along with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And I can just imagine that they were kind of proud that Jesus got in their boat. I mean, they were sailors. They could get him there. If anybody could get him there, they could get him there. And there arose a fierce gale of wind, and the waves were breaking over the boat so much that the boat was already filling up. And Jesus himself was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care that we're perishing? Sometimes we read that just like, oh, teacher, don't you care that we're perishing? I don't think they said it like that. I think they yelled. I think they were terrified. And they yelled, teacher, don't you care? We're perishing. And what's interesting is he got up. He rebuked the wind. He said to the sea, peace be still. And the wind calmed down. It became perfectly calm. And then he rebuked the disciples. And he said to them, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? He didn't say, hey, guys, thanks for waking me up. That was faith. You came to me. And sometimes we think just by going to God and yelling, that's faith. Sometimes that reveals our doubt. How do we know that this revealed doubt? Well, the one thing they actually really, really knew about him was he cared. They had seen him care. They had seen him stop it when there was a crowd around him and say, somebody touched me. They had seen him say, wait a minute, there's Lazarus up there. They had seen him hear the blind man. They had seen him do all these things. They knew he cared. And in the moment when they needed him, instead of crying out like faith would have and saying, Jesus, we know you care. Get up, help us. They yelled, don't you care? They insulted him. That's why he says, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Have you not seen me do miracles? Have you not seen me care about you? And they became very much afraid. And they said to one another, wow, who then is this? That even the wind and the waves obey him. He rebuked the storm. And then he rebuked them for lashing out in doubt. I don't know if you've done that recently. I probably have. How should we do this? Well, there's a crazy story in 1 Samuel 30, verses 3 to 6. It's not a pleasant story. David and his men are off fighting, and they are taking new territory. <laughs> and there they are, and they're winning the victory. They're winning the battles. And then when they come back to where their wives and children are, they find their homes in ruin, and their wives and children have been stolen. And I'm picking it up at verse 3. It says, when David and his men saw the ruins and realized what had happened to their families, they wept until they could weep no more. We understand. We would have done the same. David's two wives, Ahinoam from Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal from Carmel, were among those captured. And then, what do we do when something goes wrong? We blame the leader. David was now in great danger because all his men were very bitter about losing their sons and their daughters. And they began to talk of stoning him, of killing him. And the verse that I love is this verse 6. It says, but David found strength in the Lord his God. Another version says he encouraged himself in the Lord his God. And you know, Paul and I read through the chronological Bible a little while ago. And um, we loved it because at this moment, what they do in the chronological Bible is they put uh, things in the order of which they were written. And so they have put in here Psalm 56, as if David wrote this psalm during this time. This is how he encouraged himself in the Lord. You know how he does? He describes the battle and how awful it is and what's going on. And he says, oh, God, have mercy on me. Don't let them get away with their wickedness. And I'm starting from verse 7. In your anger, O oh God, bring them down. And then he says, you, God, you keep track of all my sorrows. You have collected all my tears in a bottle. You have recorded each one in your book. You care. 
My enemies will retreat when I call to you for help. This I know. He declares what he knows. He says, God is on my side. I know this. You care. You're on my side. I will praise you for what you have promised. Yes, I praise the Lord for what he has promised. I trust in God. What, why should I be afraid? What can mere mortals do to me? That is how you encourage yourself in the Lord. And that is how you respond with faith. And that is how you take your eyes off the gun barrel and you put God back in the picture and suddenly you have the bigger picture again. He acknowledges what is happening. He wept till he could weep no more. But then he says, but God is on my side, and he cares. And he inquires of the Lord what he should do. You know, sometimes we figure that once we've cried and we've called out to God, then we just are going to make our plans and go. And then we pray that God will bless them. Have you done that? I have. And instead, David shows us we are to stop and not assume what God wants to do next. And so David inquires of the Lord. He doesn't assume. He says, now what else do I need to know now? God, shall I chase after this band of raiders? Will I catch them? And God says, yes, go after them. You will surely recover everything that was taken from you, and nothing was missing. Every, nothing small nor great, no son nor daughter nor wife, Anything else that had been taken, he brought everything back. And I believe it was because he did not assume that that was the plan. He inquired of the Lord, and then he followed what the Lord had said. The third one is in Joshua. And we know this story. We've just been talking about Caleb, and uh, that much has been preached on Caleb here in Sitam. So I just want to pick up a few things and he's the man that God had said when he and Joshua brought back a different report to the others. He's the one that, that said, God said of him that he had a different spirit. He followed God wholeheartedly. And he reclaimed the last thing that God had said to him 45 years later. Talk about a delayed promise. Caleb is living proof that God keeps his promises even though it takes a long time. And you know, Caleb's gun barrel was that despite him and Joshua bringing the right report, they ended up back in the desert based on the bad report that the rest of the team gave. Has that ever happened to you? You followed honestly and justly and righteously. You said the right thing, but you reaped the result and, and of the ones who were telling the bad report. Him and Joshua end up back in the desert for 40 years. And he says in Joshua 14, verse 6 to 12, and actually I'm starting at 7, I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land of Canaan. I returned. I gave an honest report. But my brothers who went with me frightened the people from entering the promised land. For my part, I wholeheartedly followed the Lord. And down in verse 11, he says, I am as strong now as I was when Moses sent me on that journey. And I can still travel and fight as well as I could then. So give me the hill country that the Lord promised me. He was saying, I'm not a grasshopper. I'm a giant." Slayer. There are giants, and I can slay them because my God, although the land is hard, my God is big, and he will help me. So here's someone who had to acknowledge the reality of where he was, to breathe deeply some days, to remember, to rehearse the promise, and to reclaim what, his, what the next generation would receive as their spiritual inheritance. And, and I like to think that maybe he did push-ups in the desert. How do you stay strong for 40 years? I can just see him getting out of his tent every morning and going, got to stay strong. My kids are going to get their inheritance. No matter what, I got to stay strong. And him doing his push-ups, maybe he did a couple of laps around the camp, just rehearsing to himself, we're going back, we're going to take that land. 
And, and maybe he sharpened his sword every morning. He never knew when God was going to say, okay, let's go, let's go. And so, brothers and sisters, you know, we got to stay sharp. We got to stay strong. We've got to be spiritually exercising. We've got to be ready to take the new country when the Lord finally says, this is it, go. Sometimes when we give up too soon, we rob the next generation of what is rightfully theirs. So don't give up. Don't give up. And the process was the same. This is your dine-in moment. Remember what God has said. Remember how big he is. Then rehearse the last thing he told you. Go over it. Then reclaim it. And, re and then take the country. But the last illustration is perhaps the most sobering. The son of God, he faced a gun barrel, the cross. He was humiliated. He was betrayed. His friends deserted him. And yet, he continued and went through. And he sought for the big picture in the Garden of Gethsemane, didn't he? It says in Hebrews 5, 7 to 14, during the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of three things. Listen to this. Because of his reverent submission. Submitting is a big part of being able to see the big picture again. And Jesus submitted, didn't he say, not my will, but thine be done. And we have to do the same in many situations. When that gun barrel is facing us, we just surrender and we submit. And we ask God to be the one to save us. And it says in verse 8, son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. So submitting and suffering. Now, we don't have a good theology of suffering in many of our uh, Pentecostal circles. We're all about being the head, not the tail. We're not accepting this. We're just denying that. We're just not having that. And we just, we do not believe that we're supposed to suffer. But if you were to read Hebrews 11 carefully, you would see all the places where people were taking new territories and the victories and the, and the, the dancing and the, and, and the shouting and the joy. And then you would come to verse 32 and 35 where it talks about people who suffered deeply and even died before their promises were given to them. In fact, they had to die to see the promise from a different perspective. And it says of them the world was not worthy. God calls them faithful. God says that he was pleased to be their God, that suffering and death were not failure in God's eyes. They were part of the deal. And then it goes on to say, Jesus endured the cross because of the joy set before him. So we are to consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that we will not grow weary and lose heart. Jesus was like those ones at the end of Hebrews 11 who died, and then the promise was given through him. In fact, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Hebrews 5, 9 says that. So he submitted, he suffered and learned obedience, and only then he was made perfect, and he became the source of salvation for all who obey him. And he was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. And you know what I just want to say to you today? We want to be the source of salvation for others, don't we? We need to be like Jesus. And if we're going to take new territories, we need to be like Jesus. Uh, but one of my favorite stories is about a mom who was making mandazis one morning for her two little boys. One was five, one was three. And one of the mandazis was bigger than the other. So you know what happened. The boys started fighting over that mandazi. And the mom thought, okay, I got a teachable moment. And so she comes in and she says to the boys, 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 now, what would Jesus do? We want to be like Jesus. What would Jesus do? And the older boy said, 
Jesus would let his brother have the big mandazi. She was delighted at his answer, and she thought, they're getting it. It's working. I'm teaching them. This is amazing. And she walks out. And as she walks out, she hears that brother say to his little brother, okay, you be Jesus. You be Jesus. And you know we're doing that all the time. We say, hallelujah and amen to the preacher. We're like, we agree, we agree, new territories, you go. Okay, okay, well, I want to be like Jesus, I want to be like Jesus. Well, you start. You be the one today. I was Jesus yesterday, you be Jesus. That's what we're doing. And you know, we're so good at telling people what they want to hear, aren't we? The little boy said what he knew his mom wanted to hear. And you know, actually in Kenya, we, we have a, a thing, we call it saving face, right? And, and we tell people, it's become a norm for us. Uh, we say, uh, five minutes, nafika sahi. Just give me five minutes, I'll be there. And we're, we're in Lemuru. We're not even on the way. Or they're calling and we're late and we say, I'm on the way, I'm on the way. And we're hardly, we're hardly on the way. Or we say, I ask people in the, in the market, so how much is this thing? Oh, not much, not much. Right? It's never much. And then as I bargain and I fall in love with this thing, then I find out it's much. It's much. Is it far? It's never far to somebody's house. Have you noticed? We once took someone from the church to their home so they could train to go on honeymoon. And they said to us, oh, you know, not far. Maybe an hour. So we're driving. One hour. Two hours. Four hours. And I'm going, Joshua, you said it wasn't far. Not far now, not far now. Just over that hill and that hill and that hill. And, of course, we do this in church. We sing what we know we should. We tell each other what we think we should say. You know, those spiritual things we say to each other. And, and we don't just say them, we declare them. And we say them to God. But then our lives declare that we're actually saying, okay, you be Jesus. And here's what I want to say as, as we get to our, become, start to close. Our church is doing this great theme. They're taking new territories. And we're all like, our church is doing this. But do you know that you and I are the church? And if you and I aren't doing this, the church is not doing this. We have to do this together. We have to, we have to focus our, on the big picture. We have to be willing to submit, and we have to be willing to obey. So what are the few things I want you to take away? Five things, A, B, C, D, E. Here's your takeaways. I want you to acknowledge your reality, but don't let it become your identity. Um, tell yourself the truth, not just what you want to hear. Because the truth is what's going to di dictate your action. It's actually good to cry. If something happened, you need to cry. Tears were given to us release, to release the toxins that have built up. There are different tears for anger, sadness, joy, happiness, and different toxins are released. So cry if you need to. But then, don't let this be your identity. Turn to the Lord and do what David did. Uh, my, my body needs a lot of help to do normal. There, I, there's a list of things that are wrong with me. Uh, bronchiectasis, eosinophilic asthma, my clonus, pinched nerves in my neck. I just got out of hospital this morning ha having had a procedure on this. And I, I wear eyeglasses, I wear hearing aids, and I have a weak back. And, and my body just needs a lot of help. And I need to, that's my reality. It's not my identity. And my body is going to respond to my calling. What is your body going to do? Is your body going to turn over in bed that morning when you're supposed to get up and pray? Is your body going to do what God is asking you to do? In Hebrews, it talks about putting your body on the path of obedience. And you see, if I have to listen, I have to listen to my body, but it doesn't determine my identity or my calling or my destiny. Only God does that. And I'm a jar of clay that shows forth the glory of God. And uh, I just, yeah, let me leave it at that. Breathe slowly is number two. So acknowledge your reality. Breathe slowly. Ground yourself. Bring your mind to the present. Let go of the past and the future. Turn to him. What do you already know about him? Remember his character, 
his love. He's aware, he cares, he knows what he's going to do. C, concentrate on the last thing that God told you. Can you remember the last thing he said? Maybe some of us have to go back to the last thing we obeyed because that's when he probably last talked to us. Because when we determine not to obey, you'll see the voice of God can be quiet. Prepare for these things. Write down anything he says. <laughs> and then when, he, when things happen, you can declare, Master, didn't you say we're going to the other side? Master, we're following you. We know you care. D, don't doubt in the dark what God showed you in the light. In fact, turn the lights on again by immersing yourself in the Bible. Immerse yourself in what he wrote down for you. Encourage yourself in the Lord. As an illustration, it's a really short one. My dad came to visit us when we were in Chicago studying. And uh, we had gone for three years to study, but you know how it goes. The money ran out after one. And so I said to my dad, so dad, when do you think we need to go to plan B? And he said, hmm, who gave you plan A? I said, God. He said, well, I, I never made a plan B when God gave me plan A. I'll never forget that. And too often, we run to plan B. We run to it. And plan A was the plan because God had said. The lie of the garden. Did God really say? That's the lie that, that the enemy will use on you every time. And you need to say back to him, yes, he said. I know it. Last one. Expect God to keep his promises to you. Reclaim his promise. Refocus. And then do this. Don't think for God. Think with God. In fact, think God's thoughts after he tells you them. And then act accordingly. What does he require of you right now? Go conquer your mountain. Go take back what was stolen from you. Go defeat the enemy of your soul and let the mighty strength of the Lord make you strong. Amen. I want to close with a very short prayer. And I'm praying this over myself and I'm praying this over all of you. Father God, many things in life cause us to lose focus and to question, did God really say? Many voices out there say there's no hope and to give up. But you, oh God, are saying this to us today. I am the promise keeper. And when you are afraid, you can trust in me. I will calm the storm. I will give you my strength to fight your battles. I will remember you and give your children what I have promised. I will make you the source of salvation for others. I am always with you, and I care. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, uh, Reverend Lynn. You know, one of the things I will never forget, and it was a beautiful image that you gave uh, to us, and of course, uh, reinforced by what you said about not doubting in the dark what oh, God, God said in said the light. In the light. It, yes. And uh, just the thought of uh, someone like Caleb uh, sharpening his sword, running around <laughs> the camp and doing push-ups every morning yeah. because he remembered uh, in those times of waiting what God had promised all along. Amen. Yeah, thank you so much. This has been Amen. a powerful, powerful word. The Lord Amen. bless you and Paul. Thank you for as the privilege. As you return to uh, Slovakia as well. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Reverend Lynn Coles is always inspiring, and I know that you have been blessed. I have two major takeaways. One is that we should always make sure that whatever God has spoken to us in the light, we do not doubt in the dark. And the second is that we should acknowledge our reality, but not to allow it to become our identity. Thank you so much, uh, Reverend uh, Lynn Coles, and to your husband, Paul Coles, for spending time with us on the family service today. We have much more worship, and we want to hand over to our wonderful worship team. Please continue to join us. Use the hashtag, God has promised, and hashtag, taking new territories. Worship team. Hallelujah. We bless your name, Jesus. Thank you.
you, O Lord, that you sent your Son to die on the cross, that we may be set free. Wherever you are, we just want to worship together to declare that we are grateful for the cross.
dead on the throne. Thank you so much, worship team. And I'd like to invite us to just continue in that wonderful spirit of worship as we intercede and pray together. Please join me in prayer. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we acknowledge the wonderful way in which you give us promises, and not just give us promises, but you keep those promises. We want to pray, O oh Lord, for our nation. We want to pray for our families. We want to pray for our personal lives as we walk before you. There's so many areas in which, as our speaker has mentioned today, we either doubt or we are afraid or are confused, and we pray that you will intervene by your mighty power and reveal to us, O oh God, that if we focus again on the things that you have said to us, we will receive and experience healing, we will receive and experience hope and help for the future to come. We ask, O oh Lord, that you will intervene and touch the families that are represented in this uh, service today. All those under the sound of my voice, may the hand of God and the power of the Holy Spirit intervene to provide healing, to provide help, to provide recovery, and the fact that your promises are yea and amen. We can always count on you. Thank you, Lord God, for ordering our steps, even as a nation, for providing for our needs, for watching over us, providing uh, the rains. We pray, O oh God, for those areas that have uh, seen a, a huge uh, uh, influx of rain, even to the point of flooding. We pray that that will be regulated. We pray, O oh God, that you'll intervene on the situation on our roads, that people will travel in peace, uh, that uh, accidents can be avoided, and that help uh, will be uh, um, provided very, very quickly for those who have been hurt. Lord God, we want to thank you for your presence today, for speaking to our hearts and continuing to do so. We pray that your mighty power will continue to go before us. And now as we prepare to give, as we prepare, O oh God, to be a blessing to uh, this ministry and to others, O oh God, who are helped by this ministry, we pray that you bless every gift and every giver for your namesake and glory in Jesus' name. Please stay with us as we provide you some direction on how you can give and how you can be a support to this ministry at CBS. It is now time to express our worship to God through giving. Thank you for your continued support of God's work here at SIDM. We believe that God, who sees in secret, will reward you openly and abundantly. We have a common payment platform for all our giving, irrespective of which assembly you happen to attend and even for our visitors. You can give via mobile money through the platforms M-Pesa or Airtel Money. The pay bill number for either system is 933934. For the account name, please indicate the SITM assembly you attend. If you have joined us in this service but you are not a member of any SITM assembly, just write offering in the account space. Please remember that all all other SITM payable numbers remain operational. If you would like to make direct bank deposits, electronic transfers or PESA link, please use the following account. Account name, Christ is the Answer Ministries, Cooperative Bank, University Way Branch and the account number is 011. 
280-617-63900. The Swift Code, K-C-O-O-K-E-N-A. If you prefer to give through our website, kindly visit www.sitem.org. Click on the Give tab and follow the instruction for online giving. Once again, we want to appreciate every one of you for every gift, every tithe, every offering and every generous material support. God bless you. Please remember to join us on Wednesday at 6 for a live prayer and intercession service. It will be the CBS midweek service. It always starts at 6 o'clock and you can send in your prayer requests on the day or even before. We'll be more than delighted to pray with you. The numbers that you can send your prayer requests to are on the screen right now and that uh, these will be a blessing to you as you continue to stay tuned to CBS. We also want to uh, ask that you share this uh, link of this particular service. You may have been blessed yourself, but there's somebody else who needs to hear this message. So please, share the link. Um, put uh, your comments down in the chat sections. If you're watching us on social media, on whatever platform you are, uh, we'd love to hear from you, and we know that God is certainly going to continue to bless you. So once again, my name is Kwame Rubadiri. It's been an absolute joy to be with you uh, and to moderate the service today. Many thanks to our guests, uh, Dr. and uh, Reverend uh, Coles, uh, Paul and Lynn Coles. We continue to pray for them and God's success on their lives and their ministry in Slovakia and Eastern Europe. And God will continue to expand the scope of what he's doing through them. Thanks again for joining us. Please join me as we share together in the words of the grace in conclusion of our service today. And now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and I, now, henceforth, and forevermore. Amen. Amen.